Is it possible to do something that God doesn't want to happen? Why would you bother? I mean, if we know in advance, as per the question, if we know in advance that it's not what God wants to happen, why would we even bother? If we have a, a belief in God, regardless of what our religion may be, regardless of what our culture may be, regardless of whether we believe in God with a form, without a form, with a name, without a name, but if we believe in that divine presence, We, divine, we believe in that capital P planner, that intelligence in the universe. Why would we even want to do something that isn't what God wants to happen? But then, of course, that leads us to the question of, well, what does God want to happen? You know, sometimes people will come and they'll come to seek Pooja Swamiji's blessings and divine intervention on things like, you know, my child has a math test tomorrow, and could you please, could you please pray and bless him that he'll, you know, get number one on the math test. And, and I sit there sometimes and I think, really God bothers himself? with who comes first on a math test? Like, really, God is, is, is involved in, in the micromanaging of who's getting what on a math test or a science, especially if they didn't even study? Because that's what the prayers are usually. It's never, my child has been studying so sincerely, knows it backwards and forwards, knows everything, mastered the material, just want your blessings. It's always, kid doesn't study, can't get him to sit still, can't get him to pay attention, but could you, could you do something? In my, in my personal experience of God and in my assumptions about God based on personal experience, based on that which I hear and the divine environment I live in. God's not so worried about what we get on our math test. What God's worried about is whether we're making the best use of this human birth. That's the stuff that really matters to God. Are we actually becoming that which we are supposed to become? And so if you imagine that we were an apple seed, are we sprouting and growing in such a way that we're going to give apples to the world? But along with that, God has given us free will unlike an apple seed, unless something unusually untoward happens, a very early frost or some disease in the soil, an apple seed is going to give you an apple tree. An apple tree will give you apples. It's sort of an equation. But for us, we've been given this seed potential, seed truth. But then we've been given this free will. Every step of the way, how much we want to, to unveil it, how much we want to blossom into it. And that's up to us. And so I think the only things from my, my experience of God, my 
awareness of God. I think the only thing that we could do that God wouldn't want to happen is an improper use of our free will. And so, yeah, we can do it. Otherwise, free will wouldn't be free will. Otherwise, it would just be taunting us. You know, you think you've got this free will, but the second that you don't do what I want, you're no longer so free. Parents play that game a lot. Right? Say to the child, so when do you want to go to bed? Learning to try to give the children power and autonomy. Do you want to go to bed at 8 o'clock or 9 o'clock? The child says, 12 o'clock. The parents say, no, 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 no. Not one of your options. 8 o'clock or 9 o'clock. So you're free, but only as long as you do what I want you to do. But I actually think that God has given us free will, including the free will to totally make a mess of our lives and to absolutely waste this precious gift of a human birth. The, the promise with that, though, is don't worry, you'll get another chance next life. Because what we don't have is the free will to never experience the truth of how, who we are. It's just a matter of how long we want it to take. You know, if you're in fifth grade and you don't want to learn long division and every time the teacher tries to teach you long division you go blah, 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 I'm not listening all right you can keep failing fifth grade as long as you want eventually though presumably sometime before you become 35 years old and in the fifth grade you're gonna realize that you really should learn this long division thing so that you can get on with your life That they're not going to let you out of fifth grade just because you're now 15 or 18 or 23 unless you get the long division down. And so you sort of get over your ego or your stubbornness or whatever it was that was making you say, I'm not going to learn long division, blah, 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 I'm not listening. And you do it. And we've been given that type of free will, I think, in our lives, which is all right. You want to run completely off track? You want to run completely astray? <laughs> you want to run completely astray? You can do it. No problem. But then you're just going to have to come back again and redo it again. So, so, yeah, we can do things that aren't what God wants. But they never end well. Because remember that God is the creator. Which means that God is the one who's, who, who's got that vision of the full tapestry. God knows how it's all going to end up. It's going to end up eventually with us all. Awakened, enlightened, embodying the divine truth of who we are. Two becomes one. First in the awareness of it and then in the actualness of it. That's when that cycle of birth and death, right? When we talk about not having to take another body. Well, I take another body because I've got lessons that need to be learned in a human body got lessons that need to be learned with the ego, with the mind, with the desires, all right. So rather than wondering whether I can do something God doesn't want, it makes much more sense to figure out, all right, who's created this drama? What's my highest goal here, my highest role, my highest part, my highest purpose? And how well can I do it? Because I'm just going to have to keep 
keep struggling until I figure it out. And this is where we talk about not my will, but thy will. That doesn't mean that I can't squeeze my life and the people around me in a death grip of behavior modification and terror and fear and get people to do what I want. Yeah, you can. And then what? Where are you? You've got your life and your loved ones in a death grip. You've got high blood pressure and tension and stress because, oh my God, what if you let go? What if they stop doing what you want? So you can hold that death grip as long as you want. It's up to you. But when we realize that God and God's will is actually for the best for us, for our highest good, our highest goal. That's what it's all about. Not necessarily that we're going to ace the math test, not even necessarily that we're going to pass the math test. But that whether through passing, whether through failing, whether through succeeding, whether through not succeeding, whether through being rich or being poor, through winning or losing. We get closer and closer to the truth of who we are. As long as we try as much as possible to align our will with God's will, which means, of course, we have to figure out what is God's will and align ourselves with with that, for me, the most pertinent personal metaphor for me is the metaphor of the moon. Because it's hard sometimes to figure out, well, what exactly is God's will? Like, what exactly does God want from me? What exactly does it mean to be in my truth in every moment? And for me, I think about the moon because... The moon is beautiful when she's full and actually very useful when she's full. The moon is what long before we had, you know, GPSs and flashlights and kerosene lamps and everything like that. The moon was what guided people home. Sailors, people in the forest. But the moon actually doesn't have any light. The moon is actually just a rock. They actually think, I was watching this really interesting documentary, they actually think that the moon was a piece of earth, that actually it all used to be part of one and the moon split off from the earth. So it's just a piece of rock, like, like the earth we're standing on. But what makes the moon special has only to do with the angle that she is in between the sun and the earth. That's the only thing that makes the moon any different from any other random lightless piece of rock floating through our solar system. Is this particular piece of rock has aligned herself in such a way between the sun and the earth that she's able, when the sun is down or on the other side of the earth, when it's dark here, she's able to reflect that light onto the earth and to bring us light. That is extraordinary. And when we see a full moon, the shape of the moon never changes. If you're in a space shuttle and you're orbiting the moon, there's no change of shape. If you're standing on the moon, and it's not that, you know, half the time there's only half the moon to stand on, and if you're in the wrong place, you're on the part that falls. The moon is always the same shape. There's no full or half or 
moonless night, all that happens is that angle of orbit between the sun and the earth and the moon changes. She goes sort of in orbit and out of orbit, in orbit and out of orbit, in perfect alignment. We have a full moon. In perfect alignment, we have this gorgeous light in the middle of the darkest night. And when she's out of alignment, we have what's called a, a moonless night. And in, in my life, and I offer this to you, when you're wondering about God's will, what is God's will, how to be in alignment, ask yourself, how much light am I able to reflect onto the world around me? Am I full? Am I a full moon able to reflect light? It's not about manufacturing light. It's not about, oh my God, I'm so divine. Look at this light that I'm bringing in the world. It's about my alignment with the divine, the real light, in such a way that I'm able to reflect that onto the world around me. And if we're really honest with ourselves, we know that. You know when you've been able to bring light to someone. You feel it. Because your light also sort of expands. There's this, this almost sizzling kind of effect when light meets light. And you feel it. So be honest with yourself. Ask yourself, how much light am I really bringing onto the world? And that's the, the cue of the type of alignment you're in. How much light of the divines are you reflecting onto the world around you? Are people around you, do they tend to be happier, more peaceful, more joyful? healthier. You're a doctor bringing healing. So there's a lot of ways to bring light. But am I bringing light to the world around me? Because that's, that's God's will. Not that God can't bring the light. Not that we couldn't theoretically have had two sons, one on either side, and have 24 hours. But for whatever reason, this was how it was meant to work. A piece of us was going to break off and be held by this thing called gravity and then reflect the sun. I mean, it's, it's extraordinary. And in the same way, we're called upon to wake up. To experience the light of who we are as we pray, O oh Lord, Asatoma Sadgamaya, bring me from untruth to truth, Tamsoma Jyotirgamaya, from the darkness to the light, Mrityordma Amritam Gamaya, from death to immortality. Not from death as in right now I'm dying and somehow. If my mantra is good enough, my hair is going to stop turning gray and the wrinkles are going to stop forming on my face. But from the identification with that which dies to the identification with that which never dies, which is the transition from darkness to light, from falsehood to truth. So since that's God's will for us, why in the world would you consciously, I mean, sure, we all make mistakes, but why would we consciously try to make something that God doesn't want to happen, happen? See what happens when you do it the other way. See what happens when your guiding principle becomes, what's God's will here?